And we're going to Romans chapter 8. If you need a Bible, there's a Bible on the chairs there around you. And if you're using those chairs, go to page 740. 740, Romans chapter 8. Page 740 on the chairs there, or if you're using the Bibles from the chairs there. And uh, now if you've been around Heaston for the last two years, we actually, this happens, it's not a big deal. Um, I'm going to give you a little, a little inside scoop here for a moment. We actually looked at these exact verses on September 15th of 2019 when we were doing our Purpose in the Pain series, when we were looking at what does it mean to suffer and, and, and how do we as believers respond to suffering? What are the different w- reasons behind suffering? And so we looked at it back then. Now, so just so you know, this is by way of, of teaching too. When you come to study a group of passages or a group of verses, the meaning of the text to the original audience never will change. So if you happen to remember that sermon, and that's, I know I'm, I'm, I'm being ambitious here, but if you happen to remember a sermon from two, two years ago, though I know some of you have notes, and you, you have shown me after services, this was what you preached on this day three years ago or whatever, um, but you're going to find that in explaining the text, it's the same. Right? There, there's not much that's going to change. The only thing that might change is maybe I include something different or maybe I've, I've seen something different because I've grown in study. And, and that's your experience too as you study the scripture is that you're constantly looking for what does the text mean to the original audience? What was the, the, the circumstances going on there? What does it mean? And, and you might grow in your understanding of that as you continue to study it. But what will oftentimes change, and, and what happens is, is we call this the living word of God. What happens is we, we read it and we're like, wait a minute, I never saw that before, and I know I've read this. Or last time I was digging into this and studying this, I felt like the Lord was saying this to me through that, but now I feel like he's saying this to me through that. That's the living word. That's the Holy Spirit taking the scriptures and applying it to your life. Right? So as you seek to understand what's going on there, that doesn't change. But the way the Spirit might be applying it to your life, given your current circumstances, situation, may change. I say that because um, they, it's been said that 70% of pastoring is reminding, not teaching you something new. I can't teach most of you guys something new. No matter how hard I try, there's some of you who have, who have studied far longer than I. I'm not going to teach you something new. But what pastoring is oftentimes about is reminding, this is what the scriptures say. This is, this is what Paul has said to us. This is what this means for our life. And so I don't want you to close your ears if you go on, well, we've already, we've already had this one before. Because maybe you remember it, maybe you don't. Maybe the Lord's going to say something different and distinct to you this time that he wasn't ready to say to you last time or you weren't ready to hear last time. So Romans chapter 8, and, and here's what we're tackling. So, so Paul's been, been proclaiming in Romans 8, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're free from the wrath of God if you are in Christ. That's a, that's a, that's a, a greatly abounding message filled with grace. It, it is so marvelous to, to be able to, to say, there's now therefore no condemnation. You're, you're removed from the wrath of God if you are in Christ. It's a wonderful thing. Right? And then he'll go on and explain how God has done that through the work of the Spirit by sending Christ and, and doing what could never have been done by the law because we could never perfectly obey the law and so therefore we, were, we would stand condemned before God. He's been laying that out. He's encouraged his readers that, hey, you have the Spirit. If you have the Spirit, you're children of God. God has called you his sons. And by way of application, we would say sons and daughters today. They're your children, right? And he's talked about what it's like to live as children of God. You, you have the spirit within you and the, the spirit cries, Abba, Father, within you. There's, a, there's an experiential confirmation that can take place for the child of God to confirm and affirm and encourage that you do indeed belong to Christ. And Paul did this thing where I, I really kind of briefly mentioned it last week because I knew we were getting into it more this week. But, but if you have your Bibles open, because I don't have this on the screen, at the end of verse uh, 17, chapter 8, verse 17, which is where we wrapped up last week, Paul had said, and if you're children, then you're heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. And then there was this last phrase, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And Paul brought up suffering. And I briefly kind of glossed over it and said, the, the point that Paul's making is not that you suffer in order to earn your status as a child, that as a child of God, you suffer. And that if you're a follower of Christ, Christ himself suffered. And so as a follower of Christ, we should not expect to go through life without suffering. However, 
if I'm listening to Paul, and if you're reading this and you're going, wait a minute, Paul, you've been telling me that, that Christ has overcome the impact of sin. Paul, you, you have said that this body that I live in is impacted by sin, and you've even confessed yourself, I'm a wretched man, who's going to save me from this body of sin? And then you've, you've proclaimed greatly in Jesus Christ, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, right? So this body of sin that's impacted by sin, I'm going to be delivered from by Jesus. But wait a minute, Paul, you've told me I'm a child of God if I'm in Christ. I have the Spirit of God, but I'm still suffering. I'm still living in a world where I'm experiencing the impact of sin on my body as I seek to follow Christ, as, as I experience persecution or pressure, increasing pressure. Does that mean then that I may not be a child of God? If, if I'm suffering, and this is where we go, if I'm suffering, that must be God's judgment on me. And Paul's going to clarify that this morning. Because just because someone is suffering particularly this morning, if you're a believer in Christ, just because you're suffering does not mean that is God's judgment on you. So here's where we're, we're going this morning. Paul's going to talk in, in, in a way where we're able to look at it this way this morning. Now, now last time we looked at this, my bottom line was um, your present suffering now does not compare to f- your gl- the future glory later. Something like that. Present suffering now does not compare to future glory later. This morning, I want to sum it up this way. Your past salvation teaches you to live in the present with a hope of future glory. We're going to talk about your past salvation, what, what God has done for you in the past, as you look in the rearview mirror, not that he's done with you, but that moment of salvation where you became a child of God, your past salvation, right, teaches you to live in the present now as I'm experiencing suffering, as I'm experiencing pressure, as I'm experiencing persecution with a hope of future glory. Because what we're going to see is as believers in Christ, we are not called to simply live looking back. We are not called to simply live looking at what's right now in front of us. We are called to live with all of those perspectives, but we cannot leave off the eternal perspective. And when we look at the eternal perspective, suffering all of a sudden has meaning that it cannot have apart from this hope in Christ. So let's take a look at at verse 18. So Paul, verse 18, he says this, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now, that's a pretty, that's a pretty brazen statement, right, for someone to make. Like, I mean, he's writing to people. Now, when he was writing, it's not likely that the, the Roman Christians had started to experience the, the significant persecution under Nero. That, that would likely come later after Paul had written Romans, right? So it's not likely that we're, we're talking to a group of Christians who are currently being killed in the Colosseums. That, that's to come. But when Paul would have been writing Romans, it's likely before Nero had switched gears into that. But certainly, there's believers who have experienced persecution. I, I've repeatedly told you about how, how the Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish people were kicked out of Rome for five years, right? And, and, and certainly that, that when you live in a culture that worships many gods and, and does not dictate to you which god you have to worship, only says to you in a Roman setting that you need to include Caesar in that, certainly when you say, I worship the one and true God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the, the Savior, right? And that flies in the face of Caesar, and that flies in the face of all these other gods, when you say this is the one true God, certainly you're going to experience some conflict, right? Certainly when you say, hey, there's only one real and true God, and there's only one way to God through Jesus Christ, certainly today in this culture you will experience some conflict, right? Because we live still in a culture that wants to allow for many different ways to God, many different gods, right? And, and, and we'll say it like this. We'll say what's true for you is fine, but that may not be true for me. And that just contradicts the whole definition of truth, right? Because if something's true, it's true for everybody of all time, right? And if something's true, it corresponds with reality, That's an increasing statement we have to make. If something's true, it corresponds with reality, right? And so so Paul says, I consider, he says, when I think about, when I take stock, and that considers a math term, right? It's it's like I'm I'm, I'm doing the books, I'm keeping the numbers. When I consider, he's calculating things here. He's he's really giving some thought to, he says, when I consider the sufferings of this present time. Now, the sufferings, there can be 
persecution, right? I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ, and I'm trying to be obedient to following Christ in a culture that is disobedient to Christ. I'm going to experience some persecution. I'm going to experience some rejection, some pressure. That, it, it could certainly be talking about that, and it is. But Paul uses a word that's broad enough to also include the type of suffering that we experience living in a world that's impacted by sin. Living in bodies that are impacted by sin. And so when Paul talks about present suffering, it, it doesn't only include persecution, pressure for following Jesus. It also includes sickness. It also includes death as a result of sickness or disease. It, it, it includes the disabilities that, that some may, may be living their life with. It includes the breakdown of the body, not functioning the way it's supposed to function. It, it includes the break in relationships because of sin. It includes all of this world that's impacted by sin and me living in that. There's going to be suffering that takes place and nobody is untouched by suffering. Every one of us have, have bodies that at some point, if, they, if you're young and spry, they're, gonna, they're not breaking down yet, but maybe they will. And that day is gonna, gonna hit, hit like a brick wall where you realize, I can't do the things I used to do. I can't sleep on the floor anymore in a gymnasium, or I, I, can't, I can't go and play a game of tackle football without stretching first and thoroughly cooling down afterwards, right? I mean, you're, you're gonna feel the difference. Like you can't just go and do something like you used to do. Your body needs more time to recover right? Or, or you're going to start to realize, hey, I never used to have pain in that shoulder. Now that shoulder is just all pain, right? And I can't do stuff where, where I used to. We're all going to experience something at some point. And if you're not experiencing it yet personally, you've experienced it through someone else because someone else that you know and you love has not been able to function the way they, they hope they could, or they've gotten sick, or they've contracted some kind of disease, right? And we live in a world where they're suffering, or we live in a world where my, my relationships can be broken. They can be tainted by sin. My relationships can be harmful and hurtful, right? None of us is untouched by this type of suffering. And Paul has all of that in mind when he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that has been to reveal to us. That's such a, a bold statement, right? Paul, you don't, you don't know what I'm going through, Paul. You don't know how I've been hurt, Paul. You don't know the pain that I live with on a daily basis. You don't know the things I've lost in this life because of what has happened, Paul. You don't know. Oh, but he does. Paul, at least three times, had been beaten nearly to death on account of preaching the gospel. Uh, as a result, Paul had experienced some kind of injury. Sometimes some people think maybe he had an eye injury at some point, right? We know Paul has experienced some significant level of persecution. We know Paul had people abandon him. People that were once close to him abandoned him, turned their back on him, started per persecuting him. The one who was persecuting became the persecutor. We know Paul making a statement like this is someone who could say, and I've suffered. <laughs> Paul is someone who can say, and I know. I may not have been exactly, gone through exactly what you've gone through, but I've suffered. And I've lived in a world that is not free from suffering. And he says, and I still consider that the sufferings of this present time, they don't even compare with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He says, there's something coming. There's something that we're waiting for. There's something that we're expecting, that we're hoping in, that when it comes, everything we've experienced as a result of sin in a sin-broken world, everything we've experienced will pale in comparison. Now, if Paul says that, don't you want to know what that is? Don't, don't you go, Paul, what, well, what is that? What is that, Paul? He, 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 he goes on and he explains this in, in 19. He, he's going to help us explain it. He's going to say, for the creation waits. So he's going to shift to creation for a moment. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And, and, and when he says creation, now he's expanding his view. So he's talking about the sufferings that we're experiencing as, as believers in Christ who are living in a sin-impacted world and sin-impacted bodies. Um, he's saying, but when creation, so the rest of creation, think animals, trees, right? grass, ground, water, is when creation waits. So even the creation longs for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, here's what Paul's doing. He's saying, so great is what lies ahead that even creation is longing for it. 
So great is the glory that's to be revealed in the future. It's so great that all the rest of creation, it's not just you, it's all the rest of creation. They're, it's waiting for this day. What day? The day when the sons of God, the children of God will be revealed. Well, what does that mean, Paul? That's the day Paul's been talking about where, hey, hey, you've been saved, right? You're secure in Christ, but God is still working on you, and there's going to be a day in the future where Christ returns, and what's been started in you will be brought to completion. The goal of Christianity is not simply for you to be saved so that your soul gets to be in heaven. That is not the goal of Christianity. It is a good thing. It's part of it. It is not the end goal. Because, as I've said many times before, if all that was included in salvation for us was that my soul gets saved, and yet my sin-impacted body just rots away, sin wins. Because when sin entered into creation, it impacted all of creation. When sin entered into the human race, it impacted not just the immaterial person, my inner person, but also my outer person, my physical body. This body that every one of us have is currently impacted by sin. It's why we get sick. It's why we die. It's why we're ultimately moving towards death. That is sin's impact on the world. Death is not normal. It may be normal to our experience, but death is not normal. It is the impact of sin on God's created world. It is not the way things should be and it is not the way things ultimately will be. It's the way things are currently now. But it would be good for us to rewire our thinking. Death may be normal to my current experience, but that's not normal. It's not how God intends it and it's not how it will ultimately be. Death is an enemy that will be defeated. And Paul says that day is when The sons of God are revealed. So that's the day when Christ comes back and the believers in Christ have either, if they've died already, their bodies will be raised to a new type of body like Jesus' new body that no longer is impacted by death, no longer impacted by sickness, no longer gets frail or old or dies, right? And, And if they're still alive when Christ comes back, then their bodies will be changed. You can find all of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, right? And so Paul says, even creation, Animals, plants, grass, skies, stars, all of that is longing for the revealing of the sons of God. He pictures creation as waiting for this day. Why? Why would creation be waiting for this day? Because I thought it was just really about us. Verse 20 and 21. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So Paul says this creation, broader creation, okay? Think beyond yourselves. He says it's been subjected to futility, emptiness. And he describes that futility as um, being in bondage and, and corrupt, right? He says creation has been subjected. It's enslaved. It wasn't, it wasn't willingly that creation enslaved itself. Right? Creation, and, and, and of course he's, doing, he's, he's personifying creation, right? He's, he's giving creation human attributes that creation does not have. But he's painting a picture for us, and he's saying creation didn't willingly do this to itself. It was done to creation because of him who subjected it. Now, him who subjected it is God. It's not Adam. Adam has no power to subject creation to slavery. But it is because of Adam that God subjected it. Glance with me here. This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. So after Adam and Eve had sinned and eaten of the fruit, God comes looking for them in the garden. Of course, you know they were hiding, and they'd cover themselves up with fig leaves, and and God says, where are you? And they tell him they're hiding because they were fearful, and They know they had done wrong. They all of a sudden realized they were naked, and now they were ashamed of it. They weren't ashamed before, but now they were because of a fundamental change in them. And so God starts to say, here's going to be the consequences of sin. Woman, a woman's going to have some sorrow in childbearing, childrearing. 
right? Um, the, uh, the, the desire for the woman is going to be to rule over the husband, but the husband will dominate her. There's going to be conflict in the relationship where God had created it to complement one another. Now they're going to compete with one another, right? Um, in verse 15, he had said there's going to be enmity between the, the, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, right? There's going to be this enmity. And when he gets to Adam, he doesn't curse Adam. <laughs> Look what he does when he gets to Adam. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, by the way, Adam's being held responsible. That's not blame shifting, right? Blame shifting is what they tried to do. Hey, why did you eat this? Well, my, that wife you gave to me, she gave it to me. Well, the serpent, right? No, God's holding him accountable, okay? So, so men, there is no room. Some of you know who I'm talking to right now. There's no room for you to be able to look at your wife and blame her and say, well, it's Eve's fault, okay? Because God holds the man responds one fact. In fact, because of the man and his willingness to sin, there's a greater impact on the rest of humanity and creation, right? Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you've eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. The, the, the creation now experiences a curse. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Adam, where you were, you were given work. Work is not a curse, by the way. Work was there in the garden before sin. He says, be fruitful and multiply. Go and, go and fill the earth. And, and he had given them this garden for them to, to cultivate, right? They, they had, he had responsibilities in the garden. He was working. What's the curse is the toil and the labor that comes with work. Now you're going to work and work and work, and the return that you get on your work is not going to match the work that you do. And you're going to work and work, and in Adam's case, if you're working the ground, now you've got to work through thorns and thistles and, and hard and cracked ground. Now you're going to have to really labor after this because I'm cursing the ground because of you. He who subjected it to futility, not willingly, this is where creation got subjected to infutility. This is where creation became enslaved and corrupted. It is a result of the fall of humanity, and that impacted the rest of creation. Paul, in Romans 5, 12, had said already about how Adam sinned, one man sinned, and therefore death spread to all men or all people because all sinned. Adam's, uh, Paul's already made this connection that Adam's disobedient choice has impacted all all of humanity. Now he's going further and he's helping us make the connection that Adam's disobedient choice has also impacted creation. As a result, God has cursed the ground. And so now creation is in a state and has been since that time where it's under the curse and it's longing and it's waiting to be free. So creation was subjected in futility, not willingly, but because of God who subjected it. But see, in hope, which is another reason why Adam can't be the one who subjected it, because Adam cannot subject creation with hope. Only God can bring hope. And so God subjected, he put creation under the curse, but there's hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So, so creation's freedom, just like it, its curse is tied to humanity's sin, its freedom is tied to humanity's glory in Christ. When Christ returns and the children of God are revealed, that, that day when Christ comes and, and, and the impact of sin is undone, the impact of sin on, on creation will also be undone. Right? This is the new heavens and the new earth. It's why there is a need for a new heavens and a new earth. This is the goal of history. This is what creation is ultimately longing and moving for, the new heavens and the new earth. Where in that place, in the new heavens and the new earth, as the book of Revelation kind of wraps up, it says, and there will be no more sin, there will be no more pain, there will be no more tears, there will be no sea, and the sea would represent chaos and evil. There will be none of that. There will only be God's light, his presence. Right? There, there'll, there'll be no need for a sun, the, the S-U-N, sun, because the light of God would be what lights the new heavens and the new earth. This is what creation is, is moving towards. It's waiting for that day when that will be revealed. But until then, it's in bondage to corruption, which means this is oftentimes why we, how we can explain natural disasters. 
imbalances in the, in the atmosphere, in the universe that, that, that create earthquakes, shifting tectonic plates that then cause damage or, or tornadoes or hurricanes or f- flooding of, of, of catastrophic proportions, right? I mean, th- there's things that are not right in creation that, that you know that, man, it's, 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 it's just off, right? That's part of it. That's part of creation longing. There's enmity between animals and humanity. Humanity is given authority over animals. Humanity is given authority over animals. Humanity is given authority over animals, right? Okay, I just, just, that, just because PETA, right? And, and, so, and so I just want the, the, the place to be known, right? That, that God gave dominion, authority of humanity over animals, right? And yet there is this conflict between animals and humanity, there is a time where in the new heavens and the earth, it can be described as the child is going to go and, why he would do this, I don't know, stick his hand in a den or a nest of cobras, and they will not bite him. We, we wouldn't do that, but hey, we don't live in a world where we could do that, right? I think of Indiana Jones and you know, him falling into that train car filled with snakes. Every episode has something with snakes, right, because he hates snakes, right? Well, there'll be one day where Indy can just fall into that train track, and he'll be like, um... My friends, my fellows. But that's the point, right? There'd be no fear of that. There'd be no enmity between. We cannot even imagine a world like that. We, we can't imagine standing face to face with a lion and not be eaten. I was watching, um, what was I watching last night? I'm going blank. What was I watching? Oh, Crocodile Dundee. Yes, and, 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 and he was going to Los Angeles, right? And, and you know, he does this thing. He's like, and he just stares the, the animal down. It was a lion in this case, and, or, or, or a razorback in another case, and he just makes him sit. And take. Man, there, we can't, don't try it, right? Just, we can't imagine a world like that, but, but there's going to be a day where there can be peace between animals that's, and, and humanity. That's the new heavens and the new earth, where there's no conflict, where there's no fear of one another. That's what creation is longing for, Paul says. So great is the future glory that I'm saying our current sufferings can't be compared to that creation is longing for that day because creation will experience freedom in that day. All right, let's look at verse 21. For we know, uh, verse 22, sorry. For we know, that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And Paul describes this. Oh, some of y'all have been there. I've told you this story before. Um, I, I, never, I never want to, to go through childbirth again. It's so, it's so demanding on me, right? <laughs> I'm joking. It is, but I'm joking, right? Obviously, there's a great, there's a great pain and there's a great... Um, there, there, there's a lot to it. I'm not even going to get graphic, right? But you know if you're in that room or you're on that ward, right? You hear the, the, the cries and the groans and, and you're like, ah, right? But, but at least you know in most cases, many cases perhaps, uh, I need to pull that back, maybe not most, many cases, what's coming at the end of that groan is something well worth the groan. Not so if you're on a cancer ward. Not so if you're in an ICU. If you hear groans in those places, they're usually coming at the end of something or because they're anticipating the end of something and there's no hope in that moment, humanly speaking. You know the type of groaning is different because there's something hopeful coming. That's what Paul does when he describes these, these pains, these groaning together. He says the whole creation has been groaning together, which means it's groaning with us, right? It's groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. That's what creation experiences. It, it, it's, it's at odds. It's going through pain. It's going through conflict. It's going through tension. And yet there's something coming that hasn't arrived yet. But when it comes, all that pain I'm being very careful not to speak for you ladies. Uh, women, women give childbirth, right? All you ladies and women, right? Uh, again, not persons with uteruses. Women give childbirth, right? And, and, and so, and so as, you, as you go through that, when you have that child, you still remember the pain because every time you watch a show and there's a scene like that, you're going, ah, I don't, right? But you know the child that came after it. You would likely... Uh, I don't know if I can say you go through it again. But you, you know that that child was worth it. I can say that, right? I, I think I can say that for most people. That's a different type of groaning. That's a groaning that has a hope at the end. That's how Paul, I need to move on past childbirth. 
I'm getting a little sweaty up here. All right, verse 23. Verse 23. Chapter 8, verse 23. And not only the creation. So he just said, and we're groaning together. Not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So not only Paul, he switches back now. He's been saying, hey, the sufferings that are currently going through, they don't even compare to the glory that's yet to be revealed. So great is that glory that creation is anticipating it. It's groaning and it's waiting for this day and we're groaning. But not every human being. Not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. If there's first fruits, that means there's more to follow. Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, would describe the Spirit as one of the blessings that God has given to believers. And he calls the Spirit a down payment or a guarantee, a seal. Right? The idea is this, when you make a down payment on something, you're saying, I'm going to finish off the payment. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm giving you this down payment as a guarantee that I'm going to meet the commitment that I'm making. And Paul describes the spirit that's given to believers in Christ as a down payment, as a guarantee. Right? Here he, he describes it as the first fruits, meaning we, we've gotten, we've gotten um, the Spirit in an aspect, but the Spirit's not done with us. There's more that's going to take place. So the Spirit has started something with us, right? So Paul would say it another place. In Philippians 1, he'd say, I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it about to the day of completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Right? So Paul, always when he's writing, he, he acknowledges that something's been started in you, believer in Christ, that God will finish, but it's not currently finished. You are secure in Christ if you are in Christ. That is not the question that Paul's wrestling with. It's not a question of will God finish it for some and not others. The down payment of the Spirit guarantees that God will complete it. You are secure in Christ. And that guarantee of the Spirit is part of God saying, I will finish what I started. You are secure in Christ. What Paul's talking about is you're not complete in Christ yet. Why? Well, one, because the Spirit is continuing to work on me. Right? Inwardly speaking, I'm, I'm still growing. I'm still, I'm still being shaped and, and, and more transformed by the renewing of my mind and less conformed to the patterns of this world. Right? Romans 12, 1 and 2. Right? I'm, 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 I'm in a process of, of, of unconforming and then being transformed. That's the Spirit's work in me. Right? And then also my body. I'm not free from this body that's impacted by sin yet. So until I'm free of this body that's impacted from sin and I have another body that is not impacted by sin, salvation will not be complete as God intends to complete it. Right? God created us with a body. That body is significant to who we are as God's creation bearing his image. God will not leave us without the body. That is part of his design for us. He will redeem the body. Right? And so we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons. And then Paul tells us, what does he mean? The adoption of sons, which is the redemption of our bodies. So Paul has already told us a few verses earlier that we have been given a spirit of adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father. But now he says, we're waiting for the day where we will be adopted as sons, which is the day of the redemption of our body. Well, which is it, Paul? And Paul would be going, yes. Yes. Well, am I adopted now or am I adopted later? Yes. Which, because this is what oftentimes happens with, with God. There's this tension where there's some aspects that we get now already, and then there's some aspects that are not yet here. And we live in that tension of already but not yet. And the already is, is where we currently live, and the not yet is the hope that we long for. Right? We are already adopted we, that, that process is, is started, but it's not going to be complete until we receive our bodies, our, the redemption of our bodies, right? The point is this. There is a day coming when Christ will return, and that is when he will complete and fulfill all of the promises that have been made. That is when he will complete the work that has been started in you, believer in Christ. That is the day where you are longing for. That's why now, if you have the Spirit, you live in a world that's not your home. 
right? You live as strangers, as aliens in this world. Why? Because it's not where you will ultimately be. Where will you be? You'll be new heavens, new earth. That's what you're longing for. You've got part of you that has been redeemed and now the first fruits of the Spirit, you know what it means to be set free from sin and yet you still struggle with sin in your life. But there's a place, there's a time coming where I will be able to live sin-free, completely redeemed as God has intended. Paul says, and we're groaning. But that's the type of groan that a person who has a spirit has. It's not the type of groan that a person who does not have the spirit because the person who does not have the Spirit does not belong to Christ. Remember, you are a Christian if you have the Spirit of Christ within you. Paul has already made that clear in chapter 8. You are not a Christian if you do not have the Spirit of Christ in you. How do I get the Spirit of Christ? I believe in Christ. I respond to the gospel by faith. And what comes with that then is the Spirit. If I don't have the Spirit, I don't belong to Christ. If I don't have the Spirit, then this world's my home. That's what I think. Right? I think this is, this is all there is or, or this is pretty great and, and I'm satisfied and I learn to, 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 I try to, I try to satisfy myself with things in this world that, that, that can never satisfy the deepest longings in my heart. Right? I, I chase after things that I think will, will, will bring fulfillment and happiness and satisfaction and yet those things are merely just a shadow of what is supposed to come if they're good things. Right? Or the sin within me takes good things and corrupts them and use them for sinful purposes. And then I try to seek satisfaction in that. And I can never be satisfied with sinful things. It's not a longing that a person who does not have the Spirit is going to experience. But it is a longing that a person who has experience realizes, wait a minute. God's doing something in me that he will complete. And there's something coming that I'm waiting for. That's the hope of Christianity. The resurrection. The hope of Christianity is not being in heaven. The hope of Christianity is the resurrection of the body. You cannot be Christian and not believe in the resurrection of the body. If you don't believe in the resurrection of body, you believe something, but you're not Christian. Okay? You've gone outside the bounds of what the Bible teaches a Christ follower believes and understands. Jesus raised from the dead with a new body. Everyone who belongs to Jesus will rise from the dead with a new body like his. That goes hand in hand. Last verse. For in this hope, we were saved. What, what, what do you mean? What, what hope? What hope, Paul? We're waiting eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. In this hope, we were saved. The hope of Christianity is not salvation so that I get to be with God in heaven. The hope of Christianity is my salvation, which includes the redemption of my body. Right? Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? Because Paul... You're saying all this is true, but I'm still living in this body. Well, of course you are. That's why I called it hope. Because if you were changed now, there'd be no hope. You would already be done. But I'm describing it to you as hope because it's something that you've not yet seen or experienced. This is why you hope for it. Not wishful thinking. You expectantly wait for it. For who hopes for what he sees? Verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We endure. When it comes to suffering, okay, so wrap this up here. When it comes to suffering, your past salvation, what God has done for you in Christ, teaches you to live in the present now with a hope for a future glory. That's why Paul can say, I consider that the sufferings of this current time do not compare to the glory that is yet to be revealed. We are so conditioned by our world by, and by sin just within us, to live focused on now. Seize the moment. Carpe diem, seize the day. Like we, we are, live now and be happy because who knows what comes after. I mean, there are so many philosophies and ways of thinking that are focused on the just live for now, and yet Christianity says, no, you live for the, the eternal. You, you, you don't live for the now. You endure the now because of what comes later. That's how you endure suffering believer in Christ. That's where suffering finds meaning, believer in Christ, because what you're going through now are childbirth pains, but there's something coming after that is going to make all of those childbirth pains worth what you're going through, right? And there's something coming that when you get there, it will, it will pale in comparison. 
But if I only focus on the suffering now, what I don't have, what I've lost, and, and not diminishing those things by any means, by the pain that I feel, the hurt that I feel, if I only focus on those things, as painful as they are, I'm lacking the hope that God has for me in Christ. Because in the midst of all those things, the pain, the hurt, the, the sickness, the disease, the experiencing death of loved ones, if, if, if in the midst of those, as I grieve, as I mourn, and there's a place for believers to do that. But Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, uh, we grieve, but we do not grieve as people who lack hope. As believers in Christ, we grieve, but we grieve with hope. Hope of what? Hope of this. I, I experience sickness. My body breaks down. It doesn't work the way it's supposed to work. I grieve. I mourn the things that I can't do, and yet I grieve with hope. One day, this won't be the case. Suffering now has meaning because it's me experiencing the impact of sin. But as a believer in Christ, I'm in that story and that part of that story that I'm in is, but I belong to the creator, the one who will redeem all of this. And one day I will experience from him what he's always intended for his creation to experience. But if I'm not in Christ, suffering lacks meaning. That really has value. Because if I'm not in Christ and, and I'm suffering, I'm focused on now. Or I might have something empty and I say, it'll make me stronger. But who cares if it makes you stronger? You're still going to die at some point, right? You're, you're still going to get sick again at some point. Somebody else you love is going to die at some point. So if all I'm clinging to is, but it'll make me stronger, who cares? You, so you're going to live in this life and, and you get stronger, but you have no hope past this life? It's too short-sighted. And it's not what you were created or designed for. You bear the image of God because God wants you to be in his presence. You bear the image of God because you represent God. And even though sin has impacted that image, in Christ it's being made new. And so I don't know what you're going through this morning. I, 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 this room, I know, I, I know a lot of what some of you are going through, right? They're suffering. They're suffering. And, and even if I don't know you, I could, I could look at you confidently and say, you've experienced suffering. Maybe you're currently experiencing suffering. That could be, I'm trying to be obedient in my workplace, but, but now there's, there's things being pushed on me that I feel violate my faith conscience, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be fired. That's real, right? Um, or you might be experiencing something where, where you're saying, hey, I'm trying to be obedient to Christ, but everybody around me, they have a different set of values and morals, and every time I'm obedient, I get rejected. That's real right? I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to be obedient to Christ in my school, and yet nobody else is really interested in it. But, but my, my pastor, my youth pastor, my kids pastor, uh, I believe them when they tell me that, that God is good, and he loves me, and that this is what he, he wants from me, and so I'm trying to live that, but it doesn't seem like anyone else is. And some of them go to church. That's real, right? There's, there's all kinds of suffering. Or it, I, I'm experiencing a sickness or a pain that, that I can't get rid of, I can't figure it out, or, 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 or all the different things that I could list, right? Have you considered that suffering in light of the glory that is to come? And what would it look like? How would it change the way you live if you were to consider the suffering in light of the glory that is to come? In hope. And for those of you in this room who that is not a hope you have, it's not a hope you can claim because you don't believe in Christ, you would not call yourself a Christian. Listen, this is what God has done for us. We live in a world impacted by sin. Things are not the way they were. They're not the way they're going to always be. They will be going God's direction, right? But we're living in a world right now in between. And how you live in this world now will impact what's later. And if you have, have rejected the gospel and you continue to reject the gospel, if you continue to push God away and, and claim some other God or yourself or you don't need him, the son, there's a day coming when Christ is going to come back and every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. For some, that confession is going to be a glorious day. And for others, that confession is going to be a day filled with dread because the wrath of God is coming upon them. 
And God has done for us what could not be done apart from him in Christ when he sent Jesus to live a perfectly obedient life, to die a death in the place of rebellious, sinful people so that those who would then entrust themselves to Christ, his death and his resurrection, would be able to be called children of God. They would be brought into the family of God where they belong. But you can't get there apart from Christ. And there is no hope apart from Christ. Everything else is fleeting. Everything else falls short. Everything else is settling for less than what God has for you. So we're going to let that just settle. And Father, would you show us what's for us? Let your spirit speak to our hearts, our minds. Show us what it is you have for us now in this moment. Father, I know there's so many in this room who are suffering on some level, varying levels. And so God, this sermon's not one I, I, I'm preaching lightly. I really don't, really don't want to preach it on, on one level because of, of, of how, how easily it can come off as trite, not being in someone else's shoes. And, and yet God, this is what you have revealed to us in the scriptures. This is, this is where hope is found. And so God, I pray now that your spirit would meet each person in this room where they're at that you would bring encouragement where there's a need for encouragement. As they're going through some kind of suffering, God, that you would encourage them, that they would be able to continue to endure, that you would remind them of the hope that is to be revealed. That they would then endure through the, the suffering that they're experiencing now. That they would cling to that hope. And, and Father, yet I, I, I also pray, God, because there's some who are experiencing suffering that, that perhaps you want to do something about today. And, and, and so not, not all suffering is going to stay in this world. Sometimes, God, you intervene. And so, God, I'm asking you today that for those who are experiencing suffering, whether it's something in the mind or something in the body, that, God, today you would show your kindness to them and bring your healing mercy upon them. That the thing that, that has been troubling them, the thing that has been ailing them, that God, right now, you would stir up faith in their heart to trust you for that. And, 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 and God, to trust you for who you are. And that you would bring healing to them. Father, I could, I could list all kinds of things. And you know them all shrink the tumors the backs God heal the backs discs create space where the chemicals are unbalanced God bring balance flush out the chemicals that don't need to be there the joints that are achy God I pray that you would you, you, you would bring uh, p- diminish the pain that you would you would send your oil to just to just lubricate those joints, that they would function. The eyesight that may be failing. Father, would you bring your healing mercy this morning? And then, God, deepen our faith and deepen our joy in the midst of that suffering. We'll pray that in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we'll see you guys.